Okay, uh, good evening everyone. Welcome to our latest uh, Chifley conversation with Gideon Haig tonight. On behalf of the Chifley Research Centre, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us. Um, and we'd like to have a welcome to country. The office of the Chifley Research Centre is located on Ngunnawal land. And I'm speaking to you today from the land of the Jaja Warung people of the Kulin Nation. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we're all speaking tonight and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Welcome. Gideon, th thanks for joining us tonight. Um, for those who don't know him, and I suspect there'll be very few, Gideon's been a working journalist and an, uh, and an author for going on 40 years now. And when I say working, I I really do mean working. He's written, I think, at least 40 books at last count. Um, you, you can tell me if I'm wrong there, and contributed to over 100 newspapers and magazines, writing on a, an array of subjects from cricket to the courts. And to cap it off, um, the quantity of his output has certainly not uh, diminished the quality. I first encountered Gideon at school, and I was daunted then, and I remain daunted now. The prizes very much tell the story. Among them, we've got the Cricket Society's Book of the Year, the John Curtin Prize, um, and numerous Jack Pollard prizes, I think, for, uh, for cricket books on multiple occasions. So Gideon writes well, he speaks well, and he's got about as close as you can get to a Renaissance mind in this somewhat dystopic era. Though, as he admits, I think he's a reasonably middling club cricketer. Um, so that, that's, that's probably the only thing that diminishes it. Um, for those who haven't read The Brilliant Boy, it's a tour de force. Um, it's a departure very, from very much, I, I think, from the thrust of previous biographies of Doc Evert, because it concentrates on Evert the lawyer more than Evert the politician, as well as reminding us of Evert's talents as an historian um, as a precursor to what we now call a public intellectual and as very much probably a tastemaker um, in terms of contemporary art in Australia, given the, some of the people he was involved in um, in the arts movement. Maura, David, Gideon sort of brought us into this, I suppose, new dimension of um, Ebert biographies by doing it very much through story and allied to the story is a, what I'd call a masterful journey through the, the development of the duty of care in Anglo-Saxon legal jurisprudence. Both are told through the prism of Evert's involvement in the case of Chester versus the Council of the Waverley Municipality, which arose from the uh, tragic death through drowning of a young boy called Maxie Chester and the fight to get his mother some recompense for the impact that it had on her. So Gideon, once more, thank you for joining us and welcome. I was just wondering whether we could start with how you came to write this book and how you came across the story of young Maxie Chester, which to my mind provides very much the spine for what you've written. You're not a lawyer, but this is about a lawyer and it contains some very comprehensive material on tort law, as well as significant journeys into things like treaty law, et cetera, et cetera. And I gather that uh, you, you've also been teaching judges how to write judgments for some time. So how did all of this come about? Well, that's, that's precisely the origin of it. Um, 
uh, I have been involved for the last 15 years or so in uh, helping to run courses with um, the various judicial colleges of Australia where a large group of judges is brought together with a small group of writers and they interact and the writers talk to the judges about how to write uh, because they are writers, you know, judges are writers, they write stories, uh, they write narrative. Um, they try to think logically, they try to organize information um, and the principles of, of good writing are, are universal. Uh, it was something that Helen Garner got me involved in back in 2007 and I've always enjoyed the courses very much. Uh, I think because as a journalist I'm always fascinated by the stories that, uh, that uh, are paraded before these judges and the opportunities they get to um, evaluate evidence. Uh, and one of the great advantages that judges have is that people want to tell them their stories. They don't want to tell journalists their stories. They want to keep us at arm's length. But um, a few years ago, uh, I was at a, one of these seminars in Adelaide and uh, the subject turned to the intersection between the law and literature. And uh, one of the judges or one of the seminar uh, faculty members referred to uh, Evett's dissent in, the, uh, in Chester versus the Council of, of Waverley, specifically the part where Evett invoked uh, the poetry of William Blake and passages from Joseph Furphy's Such Is Life. Uh, he was evoking the idea of uh, the lost child in, uh, in Australian um, settlement society. Uh, and of course, all the judges being knowledgeable people, they all nodded sagely and said, ah, yes, uh, the Chester descent. And I thought, I've got no idea what they're talking about here. And when I hear about something that sounds interesting that I don't know anything about, I like to indulge my curiosity. So I thought, oh, I'll go off and read this. Not hard to find. Uh, I'd always been interested in Evert. Um, I'd read all the biographies of him. I understood his significance as a, as a figure in, in Labor history. I was aware that he'd been uh, a high court judge, but none of the existing biographies had dealt with his legal career in any depth. Uh, I'd always been puzzled when I read the biographies of Evert about why he'd been such an attractive personality in the first place. You know, why had he been such a significant figure on the left of, of politics? He actually didn't seem to have the attributes of a successful politician. And of course, his, um, his electoral failures were, were legion. But when I read this dissent, I kind of, I understood it. I understood that. I thought that's a very special man who can write something like that, who can write something both as intellectually impressive and robust as the, um, as the chain of reasoning that, that he constructs in that case, but also that's as obviously empathic, that, that communes with the suffering of Goldichester the bereaved mother, and understands the affinity or the um, or the importance of the of the maternal bond. It's a very very imaginative piece of legal reasoning, and I thought, well, that explains it to me. And I think if I if I follow this story and I pursue it in sufficient depth, I can sort of tease out all the interesting biographical resonances here because it was pretty obvious from what I knew of, uh, of Everett's own background that he was no stranger to trauma um, and his mother was certainly no stranger to loss. He lost four of his uh, eight brothers by the, by the time he was in his mid-twenties. Two of them were killed during the First World War. He was very, very close to his mother. He was a man who understood the mantle of being uh, the bearer of a family's hopes, which is what Maxie Chester had represented in his own family. And you know, it was a great opportunity to, uh, to study an area that I didn't know anything about. And I like things that I don't know anything about. Uh, and my response to the usual is to, is to write a book about them. Okay. Well, you certainly seem to have learned a lot, a lot about it, uh, you know, having, having read the book. How long did it actually take you? Um, Two years, two and a half years. I mean, the, the thing is about writing nonfiction in Australia is it's a pretty small market and you cannot rely on it as your sole source of income. Mm. So 
it had to coexist with my other responsibilities in journalism, which are chiefly those of being the, the, the cricket columnist for the Australian, and also uh, the necessity to, to take in washing from, uh, fr from other freelance projects. But it was also one that, uh, that I, I could genuinely feel myself becoming better informed at, at every step. And with every step, it became more stimulating. I saw more connections. I felt more echoes. I saw more about the case from a contemporary perspective. Uh, so it was a, they're the kind of experiences that I really value as a, as a writer, where I sense as though uh, I'm becoming a better writer in the process. Yeah, okay. To return to what I, I would label as the resonances that you were, you're speaking about um, that emerge, you know, particularly when you read Evert's judgment in Chester quite closely. Do you think that, and also you close the book by talking about, you know, Evert's quite strong commitment to what he called justice in mm. a quite broad sense. Do you think those resonances that you identify in Chester percolated right through um, his judicial career, or though that just confined to a few cases like, like Chester. I'm just sort of wondering, you know, whether, you know, what the parallels that you identify in Evert's life um, and in Evert's family with what a, mm. what has you know transpired in Chester have influenced him more broadly than just in his approach to torts law, for example, and his approach to the development of a, the doctrine of the duty of care. Mm. Well, look, he, he, was, he was a born lawyer. You know, he was a man who, um, who uh, gravitated chiefly towards those modes of thinking that are, that are most associated with the law. He gave a very interesting speech when he, um, when he left the, uh, the High Court bench to his farewell dinner in Sydney. He said, um, there are many problems of legal right and wrong in which precedent or authority must coerce the court so that no evolutionary development is possible. But there are very important branches of jurisprudence which are not to be regarded as closed legal systems and which I myself have always regarded as capable of further development or of adjustment to the changing needs of modern society. So he was not an indiscriminate legal adventurer, that would have been, um, that would have been self-indulgent. But he certainly, in areas of the law which were uh, unexplored or, or incohate, uh, he took the, uh, the opportunity to, um, to develop it in, 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 in ways that, um, that he felt were uh, conducive to justice. I think it's quite significant that in 1938, he took a year off the High Court. He'd been appointed in 1930 um, at the age of 36, the youngest man to, uh, to, to, to join the High Court. Uh, in 1938, he was entitled to, uh, to, to long service leave. So he went overseas and he, um, and he went to the UK, he went to Europe uh, and he went to the US and he lectured in law at, uh, at Columbia and Yale and, and Harvard. And he communed with uh, prominent jurists, um, including uh, uh, and, and, and legal thinkers such as Felix Frankfurter and, um, and uh, met Franklin D. Roosevelt and got the opportunity to write about um, his uh, legal hero, Benjamin Cardoso from the US Supreme Court. He had a close association with Baron Atkin, uh, who, was a, who was a member of the, um, of, of the, of the Privy Council and the, and the Law Lords. And I think he genuinely came back from that trip um, a changed justice, a man who saw uh, the opportunity for the law to make a difference in the world and for himself to be a leader in, uh, in, in that respect. I think the judgments that he gives in 1939 and 1940 um, are both A, imaginative and ambitious, and B, frustrated. Uh, I think he's after 10 years on the high court bench, he is beginning to come to terms with what he can and cannot accomplish as a, as, as, as a, as a regular minority. Uh, and that's when I think he begins to think about the possibility for a return to politics 
He'd earlier been a, a New South Wales Low House uh, parliamentarian in the 1920s during the period of Lang, but he, um, his, his ambitions there had been unfulfilled. He saw uh, the Labor star um, uh, showing, um, uh, outgrowing Lang's influence and, and having greater opportunities for, uh, for an ambitious man to, to achieve his, his possibilities. And he had a strong sense of himself as a man of destiny. And, uh, and I think the Chester dissent, uh, because, it is a, because it is a dissent and it is an outspoken dissent, uh, manifests both his aspirations for the law and he's um, and he's coming to terms with the fact that the law may in the end or the position that he's in in the law will frustrate his ambitions. Yeah. Um, do you think in that, uh, what what was the most powerful influence when he travelled overseas? Was it the fact that he could mix with international contemporaries of quality and exchange ideas? Or was it that he developed the confidence in his own intellectual stature in the company of those people? What, or was it a bit of both? Um, because it, it strikes me that, and we'll get on to how he writes judgments and the possible inter international influences there a bit later, but it strikes me that he's both picking up ideas and he's picking up a notion of who, who are his intellectual peers, which may, mm. You know, perhaps be a working out of, of frustration that he's felt back home on the bench. I don't know. What do you think is the more powerful influence? Well, he's not a man who ever lacked confidence in his own capacities. You know, there was never a job that ever thought himself unsuited for. Mm. If there was a problem to be fixed, uh, he thought that he or someone like him or people like him, a, a kind of an intellectual and, and legal elite, were uh, were those who should be, um, uh, th those who, sh who sh should have carriage of it. Uh, I think he, um, by 1939, he's also looking around and at the, at the direction of the future High Court uh, under Latham, um, who was a very conservative jurist. Uh, he'd uh, come up against the, um, the uh, immovable objects of, of Hayden Stark and, and George Rich, who were uh, long in the tooth and um, and uh, basically, uh, I think by that stage, time servers. Uh, he was, McTiernan was his kind of ideological uh, fellow traveller, but he was not a judge of great intellectual distinction. Really, his only match on that court in 1939 is Dixon, and mm. Dixon then goes on his own sabbatical in 1939, so he's not around. So there's there's not even that counterpart on the uh, on on the bench at the uh, at, at the time. Uh, yes, that 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 trip is very very important to him, but it kind of it justifies an attitude that I think he'd already formed in in his own mind. It substantiated his own uh, his own um, senses of, uh, of of his of his manifest destiny. Yeah. Okay. You make the point um, that Ebert's prose, in your words, has, with its long sentences, sometimes complex constructions, never scintillates, but it is muscular, rigorous, and pungent. And you also suggest that, particularly after the return from his overseas trip, that um, Ebert was drawing on the example of another Australian, Lord Atkin, Yes. To make sure that to, that he was always telling the story of the wrongs that led to things like the Chester case, um, and to my mind, Ebert and Atkin, you know, are not the only notable judges, and certainly not the only notable progressive judges who have deployed prose and made efforts to explain the facts of cases yes. as readable as possible to a wider audience than just the court mm -hmm. um, in order to promote the notion of social equity in some mm -hmm. of their judgments or, you know, or their opinions. Um, Cardoso, you could argue, did the same. Yes. Um, and he was another mentor for Evert. More latterly, you know, post-war, there was Lord Denning and 
perhaps less notably, even Lionel Murphy tried it when he was on the, the high court. Mm. Um, you're a person who advises judges on how to write judgments. Um, to what extent do you think it's sort of helped them ad advance their objectives? Or is it, as some have said of Ebert, a bit obtrusive mm. and a bit unnecessary, a, a bit flashy, as it were? Yeah, well, you don't have to be very, you don't have to try very hard to be flashy in a uh, in a legal context. Uh, the, actually, I mean, this is this is something that we talk about a lot to judges in the course of of, of these seminars. Uh, is their strange reluctance or their desire to write as they see it, like lawyers, uh, which is plaintiff and defendant and respondent and. Uh, uh, to sort of start in the middle of the story and to and to assume a degree of familiarity with the law that that uh, not even some other lawyers will will have, yeah. and the idea to write defensively as well, to kind of create, to 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 create a, a cloud of of inky abstraction that will forestall the possibility of appeal. Uh, judges write very defensively. They write with a, with a, with an eye on appeal courts, uh, with the, with a fear. Uh, of, of of being overturned. Of course, Ebert could write without fear because he was um, he was a um, he was uh, in the uh, in the apex court of the country. Mm. But he um, but he also had in mind to the fact that he, that he was often going to be in dissent. So he was going to have to write you know the definitive dissent, and that's certainly what he sets out to do in uh, in in Chester. You know, he writes a fourteen thousand word judgment. It's six times the average length. Of a, of a high court judgment in the in the 1930s, he is definitely writing for perpetuity here. He's not writing with his other judges in mind. He is writing over their heads. He is appealing to, as they say, the brooding spirit of the uh, of of the law. Mm. Um, we we always encourage judges uh, to just to write simply and accessibly, um, and to to start with a recitation of the facts primarily for their own purposes, because nothing serves a judge quite so well, or indeed a journalist as well, as just simply laying out the, front, the facts in front of you. Um, it's an incredibly effective way of, uh, of, uh, of ordering your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And Ebert does it very compellingly in, uh, in this case, and also a parallel case, uh, which was heard around about the same time, an unreported High Court case called... Um, Corbyn versus the Commissioner of Railways in, in New South Wales, which is another negligence case uh, about a, a young man who fell from a from a train, uh, and his his family had 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 sued for for compensation, um, and it's written in much the same voice. Uh, it's written with with much the same sensibility, and once again, it is it is on the losing side. Yeah. Yet it's interesting particularly in Chester, um, with 14,000 words to play with, he's also, to, to use your, your earlier phrase, very pungent when it mm. comes to dealing with what the lower courts have, have, have mm. done with mm. this case. And yet we then throw to Blake and Furphy yeah. and that great Australian notion of the lost child, as mm. it were, and the impact of the lost child on the parent and the yeah. family. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a broad spread. And I'm just wondering, you know, would the judges you teach today be prepared to venture forth into that sort of territory? <laughs> I suspect not, but- I suspect not. But look, it's, um, it's a rare example, even in Everett's curve. And as I think, um, I think Michael Kirby once described, uh, literary influences on Australian jurisprudence as being a desert occasionally <laughs> watered by the uh, by the by the odd oasis mm. uh, it doesn't happen often uh, it's certainly one that you wouldn't uh, uh, an instinct that you wouldn't indulge at, at all events but he is he is in an incohate area of the law and he is looking to bridge a gap in judicial understanding uh, and I think it, it does serve the purpose here of reminding the judges what is at stake, that this is, uh, this is an area which has exercised creative imaginations in the past, 
Mm. And that in Australia has a has a particular significance, a, a particular resonance. Yeah. Just for our audience, because not everyone may have got to read in the book just yet, Gideon, but I'm sure they will. Um, the Chester, a lot of the Chester case is not just about developing the, the notion of the duty of care in a general sense, but it's particularly about um, exploring, in or in Ebert's mind anyway, the concepts of, of mental anguish. Yes. yes. Um, you know, that a tort damage is, is not just about a physical act or not just about, you know, some of the other defined aspects of court torts, but it's it's potentially about the something that we accept quite readily now in the modern world and which has been embraced by statutory reforms to law. But in those days, and particularly the Chief Justice at the time, were very loath to accept this notion of, of mental anguish. So is this, you know, perhaps his use of literature and 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 uh, you know exploration of some of the concepts like the lost child is this just very much a product of the time that you know while it be might be nice for the, the likes of us who enjoy a bit of literature it's it's not something that's needed anymore one of the one of the things that i one of the areas that i explore in in uh or conjecture in um in the brilliant boy is this idea that australia was a country in the grip of trauma in 1939 uh it's um an unacknowledged trauma, a trauma that it was loath to, uh, to, to face up to, uh, that it had channeled in particular directions towards the commemoration of the, uh, of the fallen in, an, or, in a formal and, and orderly fashion uh, that took concrete form um, in the course of, you know, in the, in the form of war memorials uh, that had uh, dramatic presentation through the, through the Anzac Day Parade. But it was an area of uh, of trauma that it was that was men only. Um, Anzac Day was not uh, uh, an area for the expression of maternal loss, or uh, it wasn't a place where wives or children were invited uh, into the uh, into the, the um, uh, to commune with others in in suffering. It was. Um, generally speaking, one bore one's losses stoically uh, yeah. under a, you know, with, with, with a degree of masculine reserve. You certainly see that manifest in the other judgments uh, where, um, where Latham refers to uh, loss as, uh, as having effects that are usually transient. Um, and that, uh, and where Stark refers to the council as being bound only to consider reasonable possibilities and normal persons, as though a mother mourning a son would fall outside the realm of normal persons. Uh, I mean, it, it's one thing to say how remarkable Everett's descent was in this case, but it's worth remarking how appalling the other judgments were how drab and uh, unimaginative and uh, almost cruel they were to, uh, to, to the plaintiff in this case. So I get the sense that, you know, you perhaps think that uh, Everett was dragging them from this ma muscular, mas masculine, Spartan yes. approach to the, yes. the world. Yeah, yeah. Just return while we sort of we've come through Emmett's storytelling, as it were. But if we can just return to your storytelling, um, you might find it obvious. But you know, storytelling is very critical to the structure of this book. Hmm. But I say that quite deliberately because a lot of biographers tend to forget that or or try and obscure the fact that that they are actually in the business of, of storytelling. Um, you're taking the time to tell us both the wider story of the Chester family mm. and the emotional impacts of Maxie Chester, Chester's death. And then you bookend your work, if we can pardon the pun, with a vignette of the rightly great Ken McCaffrey's mm. involvement in, in all of this and the memory of it, which is 
a story in itself. I was just wondering whether you could tell us all the McCaffrey element of, of this story. Yeah, yeah. It's um, It always interests me how close history can be to you, how often you're walking past history without not even being aware of it. While I was reading the um, the transcript of the of the lower court hearings in, uh, in in Chester, I found out that one of the witnesses who was called was a boy called Kenneth McCaffrey, who was seven years old at the time, and um, and knew the Chester knew the Chesters, uh, and on the day in question had seen children jumping from one side. Uh, to, to tother of this um, of this rain filled trench in which uh, Maxi was was drowned, and saw Maxi falling into the trench as he was being herded off by his mother to go to the pictures, and struggled to get her attention to it, but she was too busy to uh, to, to notice. Uh, when I read that name, Kenneth McCaffrey, I um, I thought. I'm sure that name's familiar. He's, he was a footballer, a rugby, a rugby league player. So, uh, so I rang my good friend Roy Masters, uh, the guru of rugby league, and I said, oh, you know Kenneth McCaffrey? I said, is he still alive? And he said, oh, yeah, I, my mate John Gray saw him about six months ago. He's retired and living up on the north coast of New South Wales. And he put me on to John, and, and John gave me a, a telephone number for uh, for. For McCaffrey, I wasn't sure if it was the same Kenneth McCaffrey. Now it's not a unique name, but I thought, well, what can hurt? Why not just give him a ring? So I got, I, I rang the number, and it rang a couple of times. And this sort of slightly gruff voice comes on the line, Kenneth McCaffrey. And I said, oh, Mr. McCaffrey, my name's Gideon Hague. I'm, I'm a journalist. Uh, this is going to sound like a very strange question, but um, but do you know the name Maxie Chester? And there was a pause at the other end of the line. And a, he came back much quieter this time. And he said, I'm going to start crying now. And uh, I've got the right one. <laughs> uh, and he told me the story of, of that day and his appearance in the, in the Supreme Court. And it transpired that he had never told his own family about this story there was an awareness in the family vaguely that Kenneth had, there was a boy who drowned, but no one knew when or no one knew why or no one knew what the significance what that was in, in Ken's life. Uh, and he never spoke, and they never asked him because he was not the kind of man that you asked questions like that to. And he had certainly never told them. So this was the first they knew of it. And um, it's funny, I, um, I spoke about, I told this story uh, on, um, on the ABC uh, just a few weeks ago on, on ABC overnight. I got up at four o'clock in the morning and, uh, Trevor <laughs> <laughs> and spoke to Trevor Chappell. And um, not that one, though. <laughs> no, not that one. And we got a call from one of Ken's sons, John, who was a, who's a contract cleaner who was going off to work. And he heard it, and he um, and he rang in, and he and, and he left his number. So I rang him back, and he said, "I've never heard that story about my father before. Um, that's amazing." Uh, and he said, oh, so he had a bit of a chat, and he said, "Oh, how have the Chester family received this book?" And I said, "Well, they, you know, they're they're really fascinated. That it'd been a big trauma in their life. It had been one of those stories that had been that was." That was so big that no one ever talked about it, uh, but they've but they've responded really positively to it. And I, and I said, "How do you feel about it?" And he said, "Well, I started crying in the car as I was off to work." He said, "You've changed a lot of people's lives in writing this book." And I thought, "That's not bad." You know, when you think you, you start off thinking that you're writing about you know an esoteric area of the law. And a court case from 1939, and it ramifies to this very day. Yeah, I also spoke a few weeks ago at um, between lockdowns. I was able to get to Queensland for 18 hours, and I spoke in the Supreme Court 
uh, in the Banker Court of the Supreme Court of Queensland at the um, Australian Academy of Law. We got 200 people there for me to talk about this case. And I looked around the audience and I thought, it's fantastic. You know, this is astounding that here we are, these decades later, and we are all still fascinated by this case. And we are all still compelled by the idea of how we can make the law better. Uh, we've got an eye over, we're, we're looking over our shoulder at the past and we're casting forward to the future. And I actually felt that a really, it was an inspirational moment to me that, um, that this, this case continues to fascinate and perplex and sadden and motivate people to make Australia a better place. Yeah, that's quite an achievement. And, and when you think about it, it sort of illustrates some of the points that we've been talking about, about how it was an era when people buttoned things up, particularly mm. males. Mm. So you've got one of Australia's rugby league greats, a, a man's man, as it were, and a symbol of that who probably lived by a code of behaviour that yeah. said you had to be a man's man and be very stoic about things. In his 90th year, I think, yeah, yeah. And you, and you call him up and this emotion comes welling out, which, of course, illustrates the very point that Precisely. you say Evett was trying to make Precisely. in his dissenting Precisely. judgment, yeah. trying to advance the law so that the law would recognise these things. Yes. Yeah. And the trauma was, was, was uh, you know, this was not a frivolous claim by any means. You know, Gold the Chester never recovered from the death of her son. In fact, she committed suicide. In 1949, she never forgave herself for having let him go out to play that day. Uh, Maxie's siblings, Benny and Rosie, um, as I found out when I chased the family down and, and spoke to their descendants, ended up suffering um, considerable emotional torment. They found it impossible to talk about this story to, to their own children, but they developed a weird set of taboos uh, they never let their children learn to swim. They never let them near the water. Uh, they were haunted by this idea that their own children might suffer Maxie's fate. They also never forgave themselves for having been delinquent that day. Fascinating, yeah. So we'll go to some audience questions in a minute. And for those who have audience questions, I'd ask you to use the Q&A function just because it's easy to manage it at this end. But just before we do, in the main, in the very broader sense, I suppose history has been reasonably harsh on Evert, mm. given, you know, the talents he deployed and given the things, some of the things that you've written about. You know, it's downplayed his successes and what I'd call the positive aspects of his intellect while emphasising the political misjudgments and the suspicions mm. that about his mental decline towards the end of his career. To what degree do you believe that the ledger, other than the ledger that you've just written, has been unfair? And indeed, do you believe it's been unfair? And if so, is it because of this undue focus on, on his life as a politician, or is it for some other reason, you know, such as his apparent tendency to not manage his personal relationships that well, in common with many brilliant and talented self-made people. Mm -hmm. He probably didn't suffer fools that gladly. And he was reputed to be quite overbearing, particularly with staff. I mean, which of these things are the, are the cause of the unfavourable reviews, as it were, that he's had to date? Oh, I think they reveal, they certainly reveal aspects of, of Evert's uh, multivalent personality. Uh, funny enough, I was talking, Barry Jones rang me the other day and Barry, of course, in classic Barry fashion, had, you know, hoovered this book up straight away and had a, had a, had a set of fascinating responses to it. But he knew Evert, you know, the late period of it from the, uh, fr from the mid 1950s. He admired him unstintingly, but at the same time he said, oh, but he was the rudest man. <laughs> he was capable of, of great asperity uh, and and a complete inability to understand how his uh, how he came across to to, to others. Uh, he had a short uh, and very caustic temper, uh, and and limited understanding of uh, of of other people's motivations and and susceptibilities. So even 
a great admirer of Everts was was capable of of seeing um, uh, his 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 flaws. I think we we do learn a bit about Australia in the responses to uh, to, to Everts. Our our mistrust of of intellectuals, of clever people. Uh, we think they're a bit highfalutin. We think they're a bit impractical. Uh, we think they're a bit um, vain. Uh, we, um, we, you know, we're a pragmatic country who, uh, who, who doesn't have a lot of time for, uh, for um, uh, cleverness. We are right in the book that, um, you know, we're, we're pretty good in Australia about admiring Australians who are brave. We admire them who are uh, rich. We admire them if they're um, innovative. Uh, we, and if they're athletic. But cleverness, hmm, we sort of draw the line there. We, we, we have a suspicion about it. And of course, we've also fallen into the, into the modern habit of assessing um, politicians merely by electoral success. That's kind of the sole criteria of, of political prowess. That's what makes yep. John Howard a great prime minister and makes um, other prime ministers who serve lesser terms, um, lesser figures in the, in the, in the political pantheon. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for political imagination in this, in this country. The other thing is that a lot of Everett's successes were overseas. You know, his period on the United Nations, when he's, a, when he's a, as significant to the uh, construction of the post-war order as any Australian, uh, it was treated very dismissively in this country. If you follow the way in which uh, newspapers reported Everett's uh, work at the United Nations, his involvement in the um, development of the UN Charter, um, uh, the build for the human rights, it's treated very derisively. Uh, and I, I don't think he, I don't think even Chifley um, had the same degree of, uh, of, of interest in the construction of the post-war post, uh, post world order as, uh, as, as Everett. That part of his career has been completely um, uh, overshadowed and, and, and neglected, let alone his, his period on the, on the High Court. We struggle to get a feeling for Everett because he is so protean because he was so versatile, because his achievements were in so many different directions. Uh, there's no doubt that what made him a distinguished jurist or made him a distinguished legal intellectual uh, was probably reasons why he wasn't successful in politics. You know, he was a virtuoso intellectual who was well suited to the kind of the freelance lifestyle of, uh, of, of the bar. And, uh, and, and working on the bench and working independently. Uh, the, the collegiality expected of, of high court judges is pretty limited. Once Everett got into the realm of, uh, of federal politics where it was necessary for him to build support, construct allegiances, to work with factions, his, um, his personality was I think quite ill-suited to that. And he remained a kind of a, a one-off figure in the, in the labor movement for the, for the duration of, of his career. But uh, and yet he but, did manage to be a leader. Yet he did manage to be a leader, but he did lack any sort of intellectual peer in uh, in in the labour movement. The ad admiration for him was, I think, uh, grudging at times, and uh, and I think it probably ended the only way that it could, unhappily. Fair enough. Um, we'll go to the audience questions now, and. Uh, the first was from Maxim Ottom Camp, and to some degree, you, you've just touched on on aspects of this, but I, I suppose not in the broad as Maxim is asking. Maxim is asking, do you feel that Doc Everett was in any way a man of his time, or was he just out out of lockstep with most Australians? And I think the latter, in terms of you know how how we value intellectuals, etc., you, you've touched on. Um, but in terms of the broader perception at the time, 
um, you know, the public perception, the reported perception, I, I suppose, is what I'd be getting at is, was this of a man that people could at least conjure with, or were the things that he was critiqued about just, uh, you know, something that were the creation of his opponents, as it were? I mm. It would be the best way of drawing out this question. Well, I think one of the one of the key points to make about Everett, and I think it's neglected, is that he was a patriot, and he was a, he was a great believer in Australian possibility. Uh, he saw absolutely no reason why Australia should not lead the legal world in the area of nervous shock, which is really where um, the Chester descent goes. You know, he's taken the law much further than it already is in, the, uh, in, in, in England. In fact, England has to catch up with, um, with, with Everett's decision and doesn't really do so until the 1970s. He saw, um, uh, he, uh, he was also a man of his time in the sense that he was a strong believer in the British Commonwealth, but he also believed in the um, in uh, the importance of multilateral institutions in the post-war period for a medium-sized nation like Australia, I mean, a medium-sized power. Otherwise, it would simply be buffeted by the decisions of uh, of, of, of great powers. Yeah. He, saw, he saw the UN as an important protection for Australia in that uh, in that post-war world. So uh, he was. He was a man with a with a very clear idea of Australian interests, uh, and in that sense, I think he um, that's something that all Australians of that period should have been capable of, of identifying with, whether they perhaps <laughs> understood them all that well or not. <laughs> um, we might just segue over to a, a question from a, a larger period who's talking more about jurisprudence, jurisprudence, you know, as opposed to if it's immediate political. Uh, impact and Elijah asks, how did Everett, Everett's jurisprudence influence the intellectual foundations of the labour movement's campaigns and legislative successes, in particular those relating to industrial relations and workplace relations law? It's an interesting question. Um, he uh, he heard a lot of workers' compensation cases actually um, on the on, on the High Court, and, and almost without fail found for the plaintiff, I might say. So, uh, I mean, he was, he was appointed, of course, uh, to the High Court by the Labor government in, in, in 1930, who were keen to rebalance the court in, 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 in a way more congenial to, uh, to, to Labor interests. Uh, his appointment and, and Edward McTiernan's appointment actually over the head of, uh, of, of uh, Scullin and, uh, and the Attorney General Frank Bannon by, by Labour caucus is a, is a transparently political uh, appointment. Um, but he has a very clear impact uh, in, the Ch in Chester's case, uh, in the sense that because uh, he was frustrated on, uh, on the High Court uh, bench in, in achieving his ends, he was effectively the sponsor of an extension of, uh, of uh, compensation law in New South Wales, which allowed for the category of secondary victims in uh, in in accidents of the kind that that, that befell Mrs. Chester, uh, that uh, family members uh, and wives and uh, and children could claim for for compensation in in um, uh, issues like uh, like the Chester case. Well, I, I should explain that one of the reasons why. Uh, Abe Lander, the solicitor in, in Chester's case, pursued the nervous shock angle was because the Compensation to Relatives Act, as it stood at that stage, only allowed for damages to be paid in the case of uh, economic loss. So if, you're, if your son was working, you could sue for the loss of his wage. But if you lost a seven-year-old child, um, there, was, there was no grounds for that. You had no cause of action. So the perverse uh, impact of, of that law was to make it cheaper to kill a child than to maim an adult. And Evert sees that this is abhorrent, and that's basically why he why he goes off down, down this on this on this particular tangent. Mm. And uh, and it's the McKell government who um, who uh, uh, have three attempts at, at changing the law in New South Wales. They lose twice in the uh, in the upper house because. 
insurers are, are loath to, uh, to, to change the provisions of law as they stand. But eventually the law does come around, the legislature does come around to, to Everett's way of thinking well before uh, the High Court eventually upholds his judgment in, uh, in, in Gents versus Coffee in, in 1984. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll have to close it off soon. So I'm just going to put two more questions to you. We've perhaps been talking with a little bit of assumed knowledge about the Chester case, but um, just before we, we close out, Frank Fedrick wants to know a little bit more about the case. And by that, I, I take it that the facts of the case. So if you, you can just, you know, quickly describe sort of what, what happened on the day, as it were, and, yeah. and how it got to the court, and then some yeah. of the highlights of some of the judgments that got it to the High Court. Yeah, uh, it's 14 August 1937. It's, um, it's a Saturday in, uh, in Waverley in New South Wales. Uh, it's rained the preceding two days. Uh, rain has filled um, a maintenance ditch that had been dug, dug by council workers for putting in a, um, a, a PMG cable. Uh, they had, uh, in leaving the trench behind, uh, put very flimsy barricades around the outside that, um, well, they weren't even barricades at all. They're upturned wheelbarrow and a plank and a 44 gallon drum to, uh, to cordon the area off. Children had been drawn to the area. It was a working class suburb. There wasn't a lot for children to do. They'd, um, they'd decided to challenge one another to jump to one side of the trench to the other. It was a bloody big trench. Uh, um, later in the afternoon, when most of the kids went off to the pictures, uh, seven-year-old Maxie was, was left on his own and decided, obviously, to do what he'd seen the bigger kids doing and fell into the trench and drowned. That's, that was what Kenneth McCaffrey saw at the corner of his eye as he was being herded off to go to, uh, to, to the pictures. Uh, when, the, when the other two siblings came back from the pictures, um, Benny and, uh, and Rosie, they told their mother that their brother wasn't with them. And uh, in, in the way that, um, that a neighbourhood did in those days, a kind of a search was, was undertaken by, uh, by, by friends and, and neighbours to, to find the child that over the course of the next few hours came to the grim conclusion that Maxie must have fallen into the trench. And uh, police turned up, began to probe along the bottom of the trench and fished Maxie's uh, drowned body out from, from, from inside it. Um, one of the key legal questions in this case was, could Mrs Chester claim given that she had not actually seen her son die. She had only seen her son's dead body being fished from the trench. Now, the other judge in the case had concluded that, well, she, hadn't, she couldn't possibly have suffered any nervous shock because her son was already dead by the time she saw him, uh, which was you know, a pretty arid uh, reading of the, of, of, of the law. And it's only Everett in his judgment, who says, right, what we really need to consider here is the totality of the afternoon, the, the rising sense of dread in Golda Chester as she felt her hope ebb away that her son was alive. And she came to the shocking realization that he was probably dead and then eventually that he was dead. He looks at, he looks at, the, at, the, at the full panorama and, and the full breadth of, of experience. And it's a, it, there, are, there are wonderful passages in the judgment where he talks about this as being something that only a parent who has lost a child could possibly understand. We haven't, I haven't actually explained that Golda Chester was a Polish Jewess, uh, recently arrived in Australia. English was very much her, her second language. And she had in the course of the lower court hearings struggled to explain uh, how upset she was, how, how appalling the experience was. There are passages in Everett's judgment where he basically gives her the words. He explains how she must have felt. He gets, he climbs down from the high court bench and he communes with Golda Chester in her suffering. It's a remarkable feat of empathy that preludes this remarkable exercise of the judicial imagination. That's why I regard it as 
the great Australian descent. Fair enough. Well, look, in light of the great Australian ascent, uh, we'll, we'll close out with a double barrel one for you. Um, the first one's most pertinent to the descent, um, which is Bob Crawshaw is asking if it subsequently um, appeared before the High Court, mm. for um, people who were formerly his peers on the court. And Bob wants to know, what do we know about how the, the, his former fellow judges reacted <laughs> to him? Um, and I'll also pick up a question from Vincent Alvaro, who, because we're a Labor Party aligned think tank, is, is asking the obvious question that Labor Party people would ask, which is, had he ever reached the lodge, what sort of PM do you think he would have made? <laughs> <laughs> so if you could deal with those in order, get in, and then we'll probably close out after that. Well, of course, Evett was a, became Attorney General in the uh, in the Curtin and uh, and Chifley mm. administrations, and therefore he had the power to make appointments to uh, to, to the High Court. Uh, interestingly, he was loath to make political appointments. Um, he had the opportunity to 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 make uh, labour oriented additions to to the bench, and he refrained from doing so, which actually outraged some of his colleagues, seeing that he benefited from uh, from. Um, the Labor Caucus decision in, in, in 1930. The belief was that, um, that certainly Stark and Rich, his fellow judges in, um, in uh, Chester's case, and perhaps also Latham, decided to stay on the High Court well into their dotages, simply to prevent Evett from having the opportunity to replace them, that they remained there mainly out of spite. And it's fair to say that they probably took a, a degree of pleasure in uh, in having Everett before them in uh, in uh, in the bank nationalisation case, and uh, you know throwing a custard pie in his face. It's also true to say that Everett made a horrible botch of uh, of 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 his appearances before the High Court. He was not seen to his best advantage. Uh, he became hopelessly tangled in um, the constitutional questions. And I think probably allowed his uh, his his personality freer reign than than he should have. However, it's also true that he probably had his finest hour ahead of him, which was arguing uh, against the uh, the uh, the Communist Party referendum, uh, uh, the Communist Party case in the High Court, and and the Communist Party referendum subsequently in, in 1951, when he really does take an, a, a potentially very unpopular uh, political stance. I think. The the, um, the 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 polls were suggesting that eighty percent of Australians approved of the ban of a communist party at uh, at the outset of the uh, of the Menzies campaign, and he actually turned the tide uh, against Menzies in in the course of that referendum campaign and spoke very brilliantly and very movingly on the subject, and in some respects that is Evert's finest hour, uh, and that's what allows him to uh, to, to to claim. Uh, some sort of authority within the, within the, in the labor movement um, after after Chifley's death. Um, I suspect that it's probably best that we don't know what sort of prime minister Everett would have become. Uh, Why is that? I, I think uh, for all sorts of reasons that I talked about before, I don't think he had a um, a, a personality that was that that worked effectively in the environment of uh, what. Max Weber called slow drilling through thick boards. Uh, that was his definition of politics, wasn't it? Uh, mm. I don't think Everett uh, had, the, had, the, had the capacity to build consensuses and, and move things slowly uh, in, in a group situation. He was capable of taking great individual stands, but the idea of carrying people with him was not something that necessarily came, came naturally to him. The other interesting counterfactual is what might have happened had he left politics uh, in the wake of the Menzies government taking power in 1949. And in fact, it does seem as though he aspired to returning to the law and to becoming the Chief Justice of, of New South Wales. Uh, however, there were forces in the, in the New South Wales Labor movement who were, who were again him, uh, who were determined that he would not be able to cross the same river twice. Uh, and he might have... Um, we might remember him in, in quite a different way. But one of the interesting things about writing a book like this is that I think you 
a good biographer is capable of uh, reminding us that although life can only be understood backwards, it has to be lived forwards. You actually have to be capable of of getting alongside your characters and studying the situation from their point of view, looking forward and not knowing the future. Uh, that's certainly what I tried to do with, uh, with, with Evert. Um, and I think that in 1940, it's probably true to say that if you had decided who was going to be the more significant Australian out of Evert and Menzies, you would unhesitatingly have chosen Evert. He was a man of much greater intellectual distinction. He had probably, he seemed at that stage to have much greater political upside. Menzies, of course, had already ended his first premiership in, in, in ignominy. Uh, uh, he, was, he looked in 1940, in the wake of uh, a year after the Chester Judgment, as being a man of potentially great destiny in Australia. Yeah. But of course, things never quite work out the way we expect. And there goes the story of two scholarship boys from relatively modest backgrounds who mm -hmm. kicked around state schools through their childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, Gideon, thank you very much. It's been good to renew the acquaintance and mm -hmm. it's been a, a, a good conversation. I hope our audience has enjoyed it. Um, if we apply the test that you've just applied for yourself about biography, I, I think you've, you've passed it well and truly. Thanks. Um, so for those who haven't seen it, this is the book available at all good bookstores published by Simon and Schuster. Highly recommended. Very, very good read and certainly a different take on Doc Ebert. And I suspect a different take because you did put yourself in his shoes, as it were, and look forwards as opposed to previous judgments, of, but which have been very much judgments in retrospect about particularly his political failings and perhaps the failings of his health. So Gideon Haig, thank you very much for joining us tonight on the Chifley Conversation. Next week, we'll be joined by Kate Thwaites and Jenny Macklin talking about their, their book. So I hope uh, people will register for that. We'll have details available in coming days for those who haven't registered already. And thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.